check out this speaker. If we plug it in, it makes sound. The way this speaker creates sound is by moving the front of the speaker, which is called the diaphragm, back and forth rapidly. Scientists often use the word oscillation to refer to the back and forth motion of an object. This speaker's oscillating too fast for the human eye to see, but if I put a piece of paper on the speaker, we see that because the diaphragm is oscillating, it's bumping into this piece of paper and causing it to dance. The oscillation of the diaphragm will also cause the air in front of the diaphragm to move back and forth. But here's the interesting thing. The air in front of the diaphragm doesn't actually travel away from the speaker. The air molecules in front of the speaker just oscillate back and forth. So how can you hear the sound from a speaker if the air next to the speaker doesn't actually make it to your ear? Well, the reason is that the oscillating air in front of the speaker causes the air in front of it to also oscillate. This causes the air in front of that air to start oscillating, which causes the air in front of it to start to oscillate, until finally the air that's actually next to your ear and your eardrum start to oscillate back and forth. This oscillating air that's next to your ear is moving, so it has kinetic energy. So it can transfer energy into your eardrum, which you can perceive as sound. So this speaker was able to transport energy through the air, without actually having to transport the air itself. This is an important enough fact for me to state again. Energy is traveling across the room here, but air itself is not traveling across the room. Only the disturbance within the air is traveling across the room. If air were being transported across the room, it'd be better characterized not as sound, but as wind. So this is why we call sound a sound wave, because it shares the defining feature of waves, which is being able to transport energy through a medium without having to transport the medium itself. This is what a sound wave sounds like, but what does a sound wave look like? Well, the air through which the sound wave is traveling looks something like this. But if you want another visual representation of the sound, we can hook this speaker up to an oscilloscope and it gives us this graph. We say that this shape represents the sound wave because if we focus on a single molecule of air, we see that it moves back and forth just like a sine or cosine graph. The horizontal axis here represents time, and the vertical axis can be thought of as representing the displacement of that air molecule as it oscillates back and forth. The center line here represents the equilibrium position, or undisturbed position, of that air molecule. If we turn up the volume, we see that the oscillations become larger and the sound becomes louder. The maximum displacement of the air molecule from its undisturbed position is called the amplitude. Be careful, the amplitude is not the length of the entire displacement. It's only the maximum displacement measured from the equilibrium position. Another key idea is the period of a sound wave. The period is defined to be the time it takes for an air molecule to fully move back and forth one time. We call this back and forth motion a cycle. We measure the period in seconds, so the period is the number of seconds it takes for one cycle. We use the letter capital T to represent the period. If we decrease the period, the time it takes for the air molecules to oscillate back and forth decreases and the note or the pitch of the sound changes. The less time it takes the air molecules to oscillate back and forth, the higher note that we perceive. An idea intimately related to the period is called the frequency. Frequency is defined to be one over the period. So since the period is the number of seconds per oscillation, the frequency is the number of oscillations per second. Frequency has units of 1 over seconds, and we call 1 over a second a hertz. Typical sounds have frequencies in the hundreds or even thousands of hertz. For instance, this note, which is an A note, is causing air to oscillate back and forth 440 times per second, so the frequency of this A note is 440 hertz. Higher notes have higher frequencies, and lower notes have lower frequencies. Humans can hear frequencies as low as about 20 hertz, and as high as about 20,000 hertz. But if a speaker were to oscillate air back and forth more than about 20,000 times per second, it would create sound waves, but we wouldn't be able to hear them. For instance, this speaker is still playing a note, but we can't hear it right now.
Dogs could hear this note though. Dogs can hear frequencies up to at least 40,000 hertz. Another key idea in sound waves is the wavelength of the sound wave. The idea of a wavelength is that when this sound is traveling through a region of air, the air molecules will be compressed close together in some regions and spread far apart from each other in other regions. If you find the distance between two compressed regions, that would be the wavelength of that sound wave. Since the wavelength is a distance, we measure it in meters. Be careful, people get wavelength and period mixed up all the time. The period of a sound wave is the time it takes for an air molecule to oscillate back and forth one time. The wavelength of a sound wave is the distance between two compressed regions of air. People get these mixed up because there's an alternate way to create a graph of this sound wave. Consider this, before the wave moves through the air, each air molecule has some undisturbed position from the speaker that we can measure in meters. This number represents the equilibrium undisturbed position of that air molecule. Then, as the sound wave passes by, the air molecules get displaced slightly from that position. So an alternate graph that we could make would be the displacement of the air molecule versus the undisturbed position or equilibrium position of that air molecule. This graph would let us know for a particular moment in time how displaced is that air molecule at that particular position in space. This graph shows us that in some regions, the air is displaced a lot from its equilibrium position. And in other regions, the air is not displaced much at all from its equilibrium position. For this kind of graph, the distance between peaks represents the wavelength of the sound wave, not the period, because it would be measuring the distance between compressed regions in space. So be careful, for a sound wave, a displacement versus time graph represents what that particular air molecule is doing as a function of time. And on this type of graph, the interval between peaks represents the period of the wave. But a displacement versus position graph represents a snapshot of the displacement of all the air molecules along that wave at a particular instant of time. And on this type of graph, the interval between peaks represents the wavelength. In music, timbre is what makes one instrument sound different from another, even when they are playing at the same note and volume. Two trumpets, for example, playing the same notes, can sound different from one another, and usually do. Timbre is caused by the fact that each note from a musical instrument is a complex tone containing more than one frequency. A sound generated on any instrument produces many modes of vibration occurring simultaneously. The vibration that has the slowest rate is called the fundamental frequency and is the loudest. The other frequencies are either harmonics, overtones, or inharmonics. The fundamental is the frequency at which the entire wave vibrates. An oscillator is a device for generating sound. One example of an oscillator is a string on a violin. Vibrating strings are the basis of stringed instruments such as guitars, cellos, and pianos. An oscillator or a vibrating string creates a waveform. The digitone has four oscillators or operators, C, A, B1, and B2. The number value represents its pitch. If you change that value, you'll change its pitch. This is similar to tuning the string on a violin. John Chowning at Stanford University was the first to explore the musical potential of digital FM synthesis. Chowning sought a way to generate synthetic sounds that had characteristics of natural sounds. Chowning says, I found that with two sine waves, I could generate a whole range of complex sounds, which done by other means demanded much more powerful and extensive tools. If you want to have a sound that has 50 harmonics, you have to have 50 oscillators, and I was using just two oscillators to get something that was very similar. The two oscillators that Chowning used to create such a complex sound were not normal oscillators. 
he named them operators. So for Chowning, when he tried to create a pulse wave, every single sine wave had to be represented with a different oscillator. Instead, he was able to create these sounds with just two oscillators. Operators are oscillators that have two functions. They can function as a carrier or a modulator. It is important to note that in some cases, an operator can be both a carrier and a modulator. Your carrier frequency is the frequency of the modulator which is being modulated. It outputs sound. Your modulator frequency is the frequency of the oscillator which modulates the carrier. The modulator does not output sound. The frequency of a modulator determines what the carrier's harmonics will be. To the left on the digitone, we have our algorithm. An algorithm defines what your carrier and modulators are going to be. In our first algorithm, our carrier is C and B. Our modulators are A and B2. How do we know this? X and Y represents our sound outputs. If there's a line directly connecting an operator to X or Y, that means that it's outputting sound. If a line isn't directly connecting it from X and Y to the operator, then it doesn't output sound. In this algorithm, A, for example, is a modulator. But in this algorithm, A is both a modulator and a carrier. If we look at this algorithm, C is a carrier, B is a carrier, and B is a carrier. B2, but A is not a carrier. It's modulating all three at the same time. In our first algorithm, we have C and B as our carriers. We have A and B as our modulators, but this B is both a carrier and a modulator. It comes into our X channel and modulates our A. If our operator A is not our carrier, and it's not directly outputting sound, that means that when we change A's pitch, we're not going to hear any change. But when we change C's pitch, we do hear a change. That's because C is directly outputting sound, and A is going to modulate that sound. Let's see and hear what happens when we add amplitude to our modulator. Go to your Synth 2 page. Here's where we're going to add our level of amplitude or loudness to our modulator. But before we do that, let's see what, it, what the waveform looks like before we add any modulation. Here we have an oscilloscope. This on the top will show us our waveform, and on the bottom it's going to show us our frequency spectrum. The default waveform on the digitone is a sine wave. Let's see what happens to our sine wave as we increase the amplitude on our modulator. As we increase the amplitude, we add sidebands to our sound, which changes the waveform shape. If we increase the level of modulation too much, We threaten to th overthrow our fundamental frequency. This sound has a lot of fundamental frequencies that are competing, which creates a noisy sound. What is happening to the energy of your carrier is that it's spread out to your sidebands as your modulation is increased. Here's the frequency of our modulator, and here's the frequency of our carrier. Together, their relationship determines what the sidebands are going to be. Here's a graph that shows what happens as you increase the level of your modulation. The energy of your carrier is spread out to your sidebands. The appearance of sidebands is always in pairs on each side of C. These sideband pairs are ranked by their order of separation from C. Your first pair is M distance apart from C. Your second pair is 2m distance apart from c, and so on. So detuning m compresses or expands your sideband separation, while detuning c shifts your harmonic spectrum. i means intensity. As you increase i, the energy from your carrier is spread out to your sidebands. When i equals zero, there's no modulation.
As I increases from zero, energy is stolen from your carrier and distributed among an increasing number of sidebands. The modulation of any carrier in any way produces sidebands. The FM sidebands are dependent on both the level of deviation and the frequency of the modulation. Frequency deviation is your maximum difference between your modulator's frequency and your carrier's frequency. In fact, the total frequency modulation spectrum consists of the carrier plus an infinite number of sidebands spreading out on either side of the carrier at multiples of the modulating frequency. The values for the levels of the sidebands rise and fall with varying values of deviation and modulating frequencies. The parameters for the FM sidebands are determined by a formula using Bessel functions of the first kind. Some frequencies will be negative. We sometimes say that the negative frequencies wrap around zero to become positive. That's why when we observe our frequency domain, we don't see any negative frequencies. The main caveat here is that when the frequencies wrap around to add to the positive frequencies, they may not add in phase. When the frequency ratio between modulator and carrier is one to one, that is, they have the same value, this will create a sawtooth wave. Sawtooth describes a wave that contains all harmonics. If the modulator to carrier ratio is 2 to 1, this results in generating every other harmonic. The square wave will include all of the odd number harmonics, 3, 5, 7, 9, and so on. This sound we describe as hollow, woody, and reedy. If the ratio of the modulator is set to 3, you will hear a very tight, narrow waveform or pulse wave, and as you can guess, the 4 to 1 and 5 to 1 will give ever narrower results. A 1 to 1 ratio creates a sawtooth waveform. A 1 to 2 ratio creates a square waveform. A 1 to 3 ratio creates a tighter pulse wave. and a 1 to 4 ratio creates an even tighter pulse wave. Notice how the sidebands change as I change the ratio. You can see that your modulator is just determining where your sidebands exist, and your level of modulation determines the amplitude of those sidebands, and how many of them come into existence.